the feature size as a function of years. So devices have gotten smaller in the lateral domain. They make them smaller and they make the wafers larger, that makes the whole thing cheaper. But another way of looking at that is that if you look at the number of electrons that are sitting under a gate, it's now getting to the thousands or hundreds. Right? So adding one electron to a million doesn't matter a whole lot. I mean, the, the charge energy associated with that is small. But if you're getting into the realm where the charge electron of a few electrons is comparable to the thermal energy, you're going to pick up a lot of noise. So it would be interesting to work in the completely other realm where the thermal energy is much smaller than the charge energy. So that's where single electron memory comes into play. And why would you want to do modeling of any of this? So they grow in different sizes and shapes and uh, under different conditions and you like to understand just the bare-bone experiments that come out to guide the experiments. So modeling would be great for that. You might also use that for diagnostic data. Maybe you can guide the experiments in a controlled way or maybe you can even predict experiments. That would be even nicer. And what is required if you want to do a, a good quantum dot model? You want to have a realistic size. So if you want to do these self-assembled dots, the strain domain is actually very large. You've got to have something like 10 to 15 million atoms in your simulation domain. That's pretty big. And your electronic domain might be 5 to 10 million atoms. That's pretty big. You want to study interface roughness, so you want to explicitly uh, resolve these interfaces. You want to deal with alloy disorder and disorder in general. So you want to explicitly resolve that. And as mentioned, the, the strain domain can be very large. The strain can reach over 40, 50, or 100 nanometers. You can't just do a Mickey Mouse device and cut this thing off and be done. Also, these bands are highly interacting, they're strain dependent, so, and they're non-parabolic. So you got to basically know about the, the material properties. I mean, this is the fundamental thing we learned in Nemo 1D, right? You have to have a full, uh, full band representation of your material if you have material variations of the nanometer length scale, 5 nanometers. <coughs> you got to deal with piezoelectricity. It can actually turn some of these states around. So let's look at what's out there. Certainly there are single band effective mass models and these k dot p models, which are basically effective mass. Uh, you can write down these individual Hamiltonians for each band, and each band is described by an, um, by an effective mass. And you can uh, add more bands, and maybe even couple them in a sort of a k dot p type fashion, and you have con uh, coupling between conduction and valence bands. And there's a bunch of people doing that, and there's some references. And the drawback, I think, is that you really assume a parabolic dispersion, you in ignore interface roughness or alloy randomness, and you cannot capture the atomic symmetry or the optical anisotropy of these materials. Again, fundamental insights we gained from Nemo 1D. There's a pseudopotential method, and that's being pursued very strongly by a couple of people. Uh, what you do is really you represent the crystal explicitly, so it's an atomistic representation by a pseudopotential, which captures the effect of the core electrons and then models the uh, valence electrons. Uh, so it, it is atomistic, it captures most of the things that uh, I've been talking about in this lecture series before. Alex Zunger is a big proponent of it, and there's a reference here. The drawback really is that it's computational, very expensive. It's also periodic in nature. So I don't know, as an electrical engineer, all my devices are finite in size and shape, and I have a contact to it. They're not infinitely periodic. The baseline assumption of pseudopotentials in plane waves is that it's a periodic structure. So here, that brings us to the tight binding model. 
Uh, here are the typical ex uh, expressions for it, where you express a wave function as some coefficients of some basis, and you construct these matrix elements like this, and there's, uh, you describe the Hamiltonian by overlap matrix elements from coupling how an s orbital couples to its nearest neighbor to another s orbital or p orbital, and so Boykin and I have been doing that a lot. Jean-Marc Marc, uh, Jean-Coul is doing this, and here's a reference to the model that we pursue. So, the reason why we pursue this is we have atomistic details. It's computationally less e expensive than the pseudo-potential. We can arbitrarily mix materials uh, in this class of materials that we deal with. We have the current band mixing, and we get the band structure over the entire Brion zone. So, that's sort of the political stake I'm putting in the ground. Everything clear? You guys are getting worn out? Good. More push-ups.